jump in this morning and uh, this morning I want to talk about something that that actually actually I felt uh, inspired because it's like I, I like to tell folks that when I share on a subject I'm not sharing on a something that I feel I need to uh, browbeat somebody there somebody sitting here I need to browbeat you with this subject I'm actually when I share stuff I'm sharing nine times out of ten stuff that I personally am going through and I feel if I go through it and it pertains to my life there is just a good chance that it might pertain to your life as you're out there today and you might be going through the same thing so today I, I was I was thinking this last week about uh, testing and uh, let me find the right app here, okay, sorry. Testing, and does God test us? And if God tests us, how does God test us? Now, we know that the Bible says that God does not tempt you. God does not tempt you to sin. Now, a lot of people will think that the Lord uh, put that, that, that certain object in front of them, and it was his way of tempting them to go do it and to sin. He put drugs in front of you and that was his way of tempting you to see if you would take it. God doesn't do that. All right, let's just clear that air. God does not do that. Um, that would be akin to God being a very bad parent and somebody should call CPS on him. That would be akin to a parent taking the child and saying to the child, uh, don't put your finger in the light socket. And now that I've told you that, a day later I come along and say, you know what, I'm going to give you a cookie if you'll put your finger in the light socket. Just to see if the child would do it. How many of you know that's a bad parent? So when God says don't do something, he doesn't then put it in front of you to see if you'll do it. God doesn't operate that way. The Bible says that we are tempted when we are drawn away of our own lust and desires. That's where temptation comes in. But what God does test. God does test us. Now, I don't know if you're here today. How many of you here have feeling like you are being tested now or you've been tested recently? You just don't know how to identify it per se. But you feel for some reason there's been a testing going on in your life. Yes. Okay, amen. I feel that. I've felt that. I've gone through that. So we're going to jump in, and I'm going to show you how God tests the nation of Israel. So first of all, we need to look at the fact that, let's just deal with some facts, and then we're going to drop to Exodus chapter 15. So first of all, the nation of Israel is a blessed nation. God has said, I will bless you. I will promote you. I will, I will give you favor among the other nations. But they're in a place of slavery. And they're in a place of slavery because of sin, and they're disobeying the Lord. So they're in this place of slavery, and they've been there for many, many, many years in slavery to Egypt of all nations. They're slaves to Egypt. And there comes a point in time where God is going to send them a deliverer, and his name is Moses. And God sends Moses to Egypt to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Now here's an entire nation in slavery, and one man shows up, one man with his brother Aaron, and they're on a mission sent from God to stand before Pharaoh, who is ruler of, of the mightiest nation of that then time, and say to this ruler, I'm here to tell you, let my people go. God said that. Now that takes some guts because they could have killed Moses right on the spot. You don't talk to Pharaoh that way and you don't threaten Pharaoh. But Moses is doing it in the name of the Lord God Almighty and God is protecting him. We go through Exodus and we see that there are a number of plagues that God unleashes on Egypt in order to get Pharaoh's attention. And Pharaoh finally comes to a place where he says to Moses, okay, you, you, you can go. Take your people and just get out of town. Leave the land. Leave us be. You've destroyed almost everything we've had through locusts and frogs and blood. And my gosh, it doesn't stop. Just get out of here and leave. So Moses tells the people, this is a miracle that's 
very seldom taught on. But before they go, Moses says to the people, go and borrow from your neighbor all their jewelry and all their possessions. Go and borrow it from them. So they do. And God moves upon the heart of that entire nation and those crazy people give the Israelites all their prized possessions. You go figure that. I, I've experienced that a couple of times in my life where somebody has just come up and has given me something worth some money and said, I don't know why I'm giving it to you, but I just feel in my heart I need to give this to you and given it to me as a gift. God will do that to people. The Bible says that, that the, 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 the evil people store up wealth to give it to the righteous people. So sometimes the person that you look at who's an evil person, they're holding your money until one day God tells them to release it to you and give it to you. So just look at them as you're my bank. You're holding money that's going to come to me at some point in time. God will do that. So God takes that nation and he puts it on their heart to give their belongings, their wealth, their jewelry, and give it to all the Israelites as they leave. I mean, can you imagine doing that? Wait, you're going to leave town, you're leaving, you packed up everything, and you're asking me for a ring and a watch and some, and some earrings, and, and, and uh, we've got some diamonds that my mother had, and you're asking me to give it all to you? Oh, okay, here you go. I mean, that's, that's crazy, but God does, you know, God does crazy things. So they leave, the Bible says, with the wealth of Egypt. Now, as they're traveling... They come to the first big obstacle, which is the Red Sea. And when they come to the Red Sea, they don't know what to do. They're afraid because Pharaoh has recanted and is now coming up from behind them with armies to kill them. And God tells Moses, take the rod, strike the sea. And when he does, the waters part and they walk across on dry ground absolute miracle you know we read these stories so often it's hard for us to begin to visualize what's actually happening go home today and reread this story and ask God ask God to almost take you there so that you can visualize it now that might sound crazy to somebody but I've done it and it works and I love the experience there have been times where I've been reading and I've read a story so much that I can no longer get the grasp of it because it's been memorized. And, and I come to a place where I say, Lord, as I read this story, take me through the Holy Spirit, bring me there, almost let me experience it. And I've had that happen where I, I've not physically gone there, I've, I've not astral projected there, but it's almost as though God has allowed me to go back in time to an experience an event the way that they were experiencing it, and it's rocked my world. There have been times where I've sat in the front room for hours reliving a simple experience. The first time that happened to me was through Samson when his hand cleaved, the Bible said, cleaved to the jawbone of the ass after, after slaughtering hundreds of Philistines. And he grew so tired, he, he couldn't open his fist and let go of the jawbone. And I asked the Lord, I was just a young guy, I said, God, I, I want to know what that feels like. How, how does that happen? How does a man feel that way? And, 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 and can I just somehow help me to understand it? And I sat back in the chair, and it was almost like a movie. I was there with Samson, experiencing what he was experiencing, fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting, and fighting until there was no more strength at all and my hand locked on the jawbone of the ass and I knew what he felt like and I looked at the clock and hours had gone by that I had sat in that chair living the experience God so wants you to understand the power of his word that sometimes he might just take you back in time just a touch to experience it So do that today. Go and ask the Lord, what was it like to stand before a sea? 
a, a sea, an ocean, not a lake, not a creek, a sea, an ocean. What is it like to stand there and the enemy is coming with chariots and swords drawn and archers and, and they're going to wipe us out. We're dead men right here. What is that like? And then this Moses who we're following goes out and he hits the water and it parts. The sea parts. Walls of water, hundreds of feet in the air, it parts. And we walk across, not in the mud, but on dry ground we walk across. Can you imagine being there and the power of that experience? And you come out the other end and you're going, oh my God, what just happened? We've been set free. What just happened? We're still alive. But they're still coming. And they're now going through the parted sea. And all of a sudden, Moses taps the water. And the waters close in on them and annihilates the entire Egyptian army. Woo! Man, I'll tell you what. I'd be standing on the other side of the sea going, there is nothing like God. Man, he can do just about anything he wants. Let's see, part C, uh -uh, I'm never doubting God another day in my life. And I believe you would say the same thing. But we come to Exodus chapter 15, and Exodus chapter 15 tells us now that they're on the other side of the Red Sea. And in verse 22 through verse 27, something interesting begins to happen. And in... Chapter 15, I'm just going to read these few verses. It says, Moses led Israel from the Red Sea onto the wilderness of Shur, and they traveled three days through the wilderness without finding any water. There's no water. They're in the desert, and there's no water. And they got to Mara, but they couldn't drink the water at Mara. It was bitter. And that's why they call the place Mara, bitter. And the people complained to Moses, so what are we supposed to drink? What are we going to drink? You let us out here, we're in the middle of the desert, and there's no water. What are we going to drink? This water is tainted, it's soured, we cannot drink it. If we do, we'll die. What are we going to do? So Moses cried out in prayer to God, and God pointed him to a stick of wood, and Moses threw it into the water, and the water turned sweet. Now, listen to what is said next, and this is what I have highlighted in my Bible. It said, that's the place where God set up rules and procedures. That's where he started testing them. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean there was a test embedded in this experience? That's where he started testing them. God said, if you listen, listen obediently to how God tells you to live in his presence, obeying his commands and keeping his laws, then I won't strike you with the diseases I inflicted on the Egyptians. I am God, your healer. <laughs> then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees, and they set up camp there by the water. This is where God started to test them. Now, now, now listen. They had just come from a victory. They had just come from a victory of such magnitude that if that doesn't build your faith level, you must be dead because nothing will build your faith level. You're standing on the brink of a sea and it parts for you? You've just spent months watching the Egyptians go through plague after plague after plague till they finally let you go and now you're on the other side safe the sea has swallowed up their army they can never come get you again and so you take a little march in the desert and there's no water and when there's no water, you begin to complain and to gripe, and you begin to go after Moses and say, why'd you bring us here to die with no water? Why did you do that? 
Moses cries out to God. God makes the water pure. They get water, and they're happy again. Test number one. Well, it's interesting because if you go down to chapter 16, the very next chapter, you see test number two. So in chapter 16, and we're reading verse 1 through verse 5, it says, on the 15th day of the second month, so they're month two in the journey, month two, they've just seen Egypt plague, gone through the Red Sea, the Egyptian army swallowed up, bitter water turned sweet, now they're marching again, and in verse 1 it says, On the 15th day of the second month after they left Egypt, the whole company of Israel moved on from Elam into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, and the whole company of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. They're in the wilderness. The Israelites said, Why did God let us die why didn't God let us die in comfort in Egypt where we had lamb stew and all the bread we could eat? You brought us out into this wilderness to starve us to death, the whole company of Israel. Here we are again. No food, no water. And they're complaining to Moses and they're saying, you've let us out here to kill us. We're going to die. We wish we could go back to Egypt. You know, sometimes when you go through things, when you go through testing moments, sometimes you look back and it always seemed better. It always seemed like the grass was greener back there. You, you forget the reality of what it was like back there. All of a sudden the grass is greener and you want to go back to it. A lot of people that God is delivering from addiction and all of a sudden, they go through a rough spot in life, and they go through some testing. And what, what's the first thing they think? Well, I was happier when I was addicted. Well, I was happier when I was using. Were you really? Seems to me like you lost everything. You lost your health, and you were next to death. But you were happier then, right? You become delusional with the past. Never let the present dictate how you look at the past. The past is the past, and be thankful you're far from it. Don't ever think about going back and reliving it. <clears throat> so God said to Moses, God said, I'm going to rain bread down from the skies for you, and the people will go out and gather it each day, and I'm going to, listen again, I'm going to test them to see if they'll live according to my teachings or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they have gathered, it will turn out to be twice as much as their daily ration. So the story goes on that Moses gives them instruction as to go out and how to gather manna. You gather enough for your one day, and to gather the next day for the day. You never gather ahead to store for upcoming days or it will rot by the next morning, plain and simple. And on the, on the day before the Sabbath, you gather, gather twice as much so that you have enough for the Sabbath because the Sabbath is a day of rest. Do not go out and gather. Well, the text tells us that they went out and they started hoarding it, hoarding it and they brought it in and it did just what God said. It rotted. It was no good in the morning. They had to go out and gather again. And they went out on the Sabbath looking for manna and it wasn't there because God said it wouldn't be there on the Sabbath. These people cannot get it through their head. Simply do what God has asked you to do. Stop overthinking it. Stop overdoing. Stop everything and just do what God has asked to do. God has made it very simple. Gather this much and no more. What do they do? They take it in their own mind. Well, if that much works, more works even better. So I'll just gather more. You're to rest on the Sabbath, gather the twice as much on Saturday, and it won't spoil overnight because of the Sabbath. I'll keep it fresh for you. So what do they do? They gather, they go out and gather again on the Sabbath. They just don't get it. These are people that fail every single test that come their way.
we drop down into chapter 17, the next chapter. And this is the, good, the big one. Chapter 17, it says, And God directed the whole company of Israel, moved on by stages from the wilderness of sin, and they set up camp at Rephidim. And there wasn't a drop of water for the people to drink. Oh, it's the same issue. You know, if you have half a brain and you're going through the desert, you got to know there's no water out there. Right? Don't look for it. You ain't going to find it. And don't get mad at the guy leading it, leading you because he can't produce it. You have to know going through the desert, there is no water. So the only water source you're going to have is going to come directly from God. Start looking to God. And asking God to give you water, and God will give you the water. Amen. But they're looking in all the places except God, and they're getting frustrated, and they're getting mad, and they're getting mad at the guy leading them, and now they're blaming him for no water. And the people took Moses to task, give us water to drink. But Moses said, why are you pestering me? Why are you testing God? Why are you testing God? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, Why did you take us from Egypt and drag us out here with our children and animals to die of thirst? Why did you bring us here to die of thirst? Do you see where they're going with this? Now you want to kill us. You brought us out here specifically to die of thirst. In essence, they're saying, God, you have failed us. You have led us into this death zone. You have failed us. You're not going to do anything that you said you would do for us. And Moses cried out in prayer to God, what can I do with these people any minute? They're going to kill me. And God said to Moses, Go on out ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders and take the staff you used to strike the Nile and go and I'm going, to, I'm going to be present before you there at the rock at Horeb and you are to strike the rock and water will gush out of it and the people will drink. Moses did what he said with the elders of Israel right there watching and he named the place Massa or testing place, Meribeth, quarreling, because of the quarreling of the Israelites and because their testing of God when they said, is God here with us or not? Amazing. They've come from a miracle experience the nether miracle get on the other side of the Red Sea God blesses them with water they complain they go on further their next stop they complain God blesses them with water and manna and quail he gives them meat bread and water they're happy they go on a little further in the next place they're out of water again and they complain to God they complain to Moses, and they say, is God here with us or not? Based on what they're going through. I wonder how many of us do that. I wonder how many of us, we go through a tough time, we go through a time of testing, and in that we say, is God here with us or not? Is he here really with us or not? Because I'm not being blessed. I'm not having all my needs met just like that. I'm, I, I'm experiencing some rough times. Is God with me or not? Is God here or not? And yet we forget all of the things that God has brought us through and all the blessings he has blessed us with. We forget those things in that moment. We forget that he has saved you. We forget that he has cleaned you. We forget that he has brought your family back together. We forget that he's blessed us financially. We forget all the things that God has done. 
and we focus on the fact that I don't have what I need at this moment, and so therefore God must not be with me. Amazing. We're no different than they are. We just aren't tromping through the desert. But we're no different than they are. Do you know the one person who never worried about the water or the food was Moses? Because Moses knew where it would have to come from in a desert. When you go into a place that God is leading you and you know that it doesn't have what you need, you know that there's only one place you're going to get it and it's from God. It ain't going to come from anybody else. It ain't going to come from an institution. It's coming directly from God or you're not going to get it. And in that you can rest. God's got me. God's got my back. I, I don't have to depend on you to have my back because God's got my back. God will take care of me. God will meet my needs. I don't have to worry about my job. I don't have to worry about Social Security. I don't have to worry about GA. I don't have to worry about EBT. I don't have to. It can all go away because it's not my source. God is my source. And without it, he will find another way to supply my needs. <clears throat> so I have nothing to worry about. You know, it's interesting. I think I'm going to give you a couple of points. I'm going to get you a couple of points. Listen, listen carefully. The devil works in the word if. In fact, in fact, if you look at the devil's vocabulary, it is one of his favorite words, if. Just do that one day. Go through every time the devil shows up and see what he says, and you'll find the word if somewhere embedded in the sentence. Go ahead and highlight it. Just play a little game. Do that. When he stood before the Lord regarding Job, he said, basically, if Job only fears you because of your covering your favor, if you take it away, he will not fear you and he'll curse you and die. If. What was the... What was the last thing that Jesus heard from the Father when he was dying? What was the last thing that Jesus heard from the Father, from God Almighty? What was the last thing he heard? The last thing he heard was, you are my beloved son. Last thing he heard, you are my beloved son. What was the first thing he heard from the devil when he met the devil? If you are the son of God. You see that word if? God said, you are my beloved son, but the devil says, if you are the son. In fact, if you look at the temptations in the wilderness, two of the three temptations started with the word if. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. If you're the son of God, take these rocks and make them bread. If you're the son of God, show me, go ahead and do it. It starts with the word if. When he tempted the woman in the wilderness, it was basically with the word if. Did God really say? Did God say? Are you sure? What if he didn't say? If. And when you begin to dwell on the word if, you have just failed the test that God may be setting up for you. Anytime you dwell and you, and you stay on that word if, it becomes the place that you fail the test. If God, well, maybe God didn't. Maybe God didn't say it. Maybe God didn't mean it that way. Maybe, maybe, maybe. We're facing some horrendous financial challenges right now, the city church. Um, Deborah and I uh, discussed it, and she said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? How are you going to get us out of this jam? Because we lost, when the city shut us down, we lost our on, online presence, and some things are 
giving dropped, attendance dropped, a number of things happened. And across the board, it all accumulated to about a 30% loss. Hit us really bad. And uh, uh, what are you going to do? She brought me some bills last night and said, I, I've made a list of all the bills. You don't want to look at them tonight because you'll just have a depressed evening. So I didn't. I put them away on my desk. I brought them back and put them on my desk. I'm not, I haven't looked at them yet. And I thought, you know, what, 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 what am I going to do? What are we going to do? That word if is always there. Well, are you sure that God wants uh, going to bless City Church? What if he doesn't? What if, what if you don't win the battle with the city? What if, you see, what if, what if, what if? There's always a drop of giving in summer, but never this drastic. What if it, what if it doesn't return, giving doesn't go up again in the winter? What if, what are you going to do? What if? And there comes a point where you say, you know, that if, wherever if is, you'll find the devil close to it. Because that's his favorite word, what if. And then my go-to place is, is that in the natural, there isn't an answer. In the, in the natural, people aren't going to give more than they're giving because they're probably giving all they can give to begin with. So you're not going to hammer people for more money. So, so there is no answer in the natural unless I go rob a bank. Then I'll be going to prison and you'll have to put money on my book so you'll still be given money. So, so, so there is no what if. There is no answer to a what if. There is none except discouragement and wanting to quit. That's what the children of Israel did. Discouragement, and I want to go back to Egypt where I could eat lamb stew at least. Just let me go back and die there. Because that becomes your only answer is I quit. But somewhere to pass that test, you've got to say, there is nobody that can help us. There is no bank going to help us. There's no institution that's going to help us. There's no grant that's going to help us. And I'm not looking to any of those. I'm looking to God Almighty who can rain manna from heaven. God can throw a few bucks down with the manna and bless us and pay some bills off. God can do it. He's done it before. He's done it multiple times. He can do it again. If has come out of my vocabulary, out of my head. I'm not thinking it. I'm not dwelling on it. I'm looking to God Almighty for only the answers he can provide. <clears throat> when you're in the desert to expect anything more, you're ludicrous. Deserts don't have water. They don't have food you best look to God as your provider, as your giver, and as the one who sustains you, because without it, you'll die there. There is no if. I'm going to leave you with this. You can always tell how big the if is playing in a person's life by what comes out of their mouth. It's a sure giveaway. Because the Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Have you ever been around somebody that's going through it, or maybe they're going through an illness or, or, or something or their life that just seems like everything is happening that's going wrong? Have you ever been around them and listened to what comes out of their mouth? 90% of it is negative. They're giving up. They're throwing in the towel. They don't know what's going to happen, how they're going to deal with it. Let me tell you, I'm going to give you a key. If you remember anything I said, you remember this key. When you're dealing with the subject of if, watch what comes out of here. Because the Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death 
are in the power of the tongue. When you agree with the promises of God, when you agree with the promises of God, you affirm them, and when you affirm them, they become factual. Now, I'm not saying that you live a fake life and that when you're sick, you don't tell people you're sick and because you think that's negative. I'm not talking about being dishonest. Many Christians live a dishonest life. Well, how are you doing? <coughs> oh, I'm doing just fine. Highly blessed, favorite of God. Thank you. <coughs> no, in reality, you're sicker than a dog. Just say so, for heaven's sakes. But when I affirm... When I affirm the promise of God, I am sick, but I'm believing the Lord to touch my body. I'm being real, but I'm affirming in that the promise of God. The opposite effect is I'm sick and I don't think I'm gonna get better, I'll probably die. <laughs> Help me. That's the opposite. It's what comes out of here. It's like this, it's like this. <clears throat> When you affirm the promise of God, it goes into effect immediately. It goes into effect immediately. Heaven opens, boom, angels descend. It goes into effect immediately, whether you see it or not. Never said, how are you going to pay the bills? Honey, I don't know. I have no clue how we're going to pay the bills. I do know this, that God said that he has got us here for a reason. City Church has planted the kingdom of heaven in this area for a reason. And he takes care of his kingdom outreaches. And he's going to take care of us financially. I don't know how it's coming. But it's on its way. <clears throat> I acknowledge the problem, but I affirm the blessing. And when I affirm the blessing, it's on its way. I mean, it literally is on its way. I can guarantee you, it is on its way. It's like being pregnant. If you're a mother and you don't show, but you have a, a, a knowing sense that there is a little child in you, you, you know that you are pregnant regardless of what people see. And in enough time, people might see a little bump, but they still don't see a baby. And as time, time goes, they might see the baby kick, but they still don't see the baby. But you know there's a baby growing inside of you. You know because you know because you know. You know it so well that you've named the baby before it's come out. You've already named it, you picked out clothes for it. You've decorated a room for it. You've got that baby planned out for the, the, the next 20 years of its life because you know it's there. It's just a matter of time to come. That's what faith does with the promises of God. I don't see it, but I feel a little bump growing. And that little bump pretty soon is going to start moving. And in time, it's going to give full birth that I'm going to see the evidence of God's blessing. But what happens when you begin to speak negative talk? Like the children of Israel. Do you, do you know that the children of Israel, do you know that as you go through this story, do you know they never made it into the promised land? They never made it. They failed every test God gave them. He could never affirm his promise to them because they negated it by what they said. Can God? Will God? Why doesn't God? Where's the water? Then when they went and spied out the land, we can't go. There are giants out there. They'll kill us. Man, I've never heard a group of people see so many miracles, win so many battles, and yet deny God to the extent they deny God. 
God said, well, you'll never go to the promised land. If you cannot affirm the promise, you don't get the promise. So when we begin to speak negativity about what we're going through and what God is trying to do in our life, and we begin to speak negativity, what happens? You have just given the devil groundwork. You've just given the devil license to act on what you've said. You have just aborted the promises of God. You've just aborted the promise of God. And that's why so many people never see promises fulfilled in their life. They can have prophetic words over them. They can read them in God's word. They, but they never see the fulfillment of the promises of God because they are always aborting them by what they say. Is God, can God, will God? I don't know if God does anymore. At some point, you got to be not like the children of Israel going through the desert. At some point, you got to say, God has started me on this road, man. He's delivered me from Egypt. He's delivered me from all that bondage. You know what? Going back is not an option. There's nothing to go back to. And as I start this journey following the Lord, I might come into some desert places. Water's important. Food is important. That's how you stay alive. And I might not know how I'm going to stay alive because I don't see the water or the food, but I'm trusting God that if I have to hit a rock and water's coming out of that rock, so be it. But I'm trusting God to give me water. He will sustain me. And as I march on and I come to a place where I'm going in the promised land and I see the giants and I see all the opposition, I'm not going to look at how big they are. Giants love to get you to look at them. You know why? Because it'll intimidate you. Sometimes don't look at the giant. Don't look at the giant. Just don't stare at him. Say, I don't care how big you are. I am not focusing on that. I'm focusing on a God that is bigger than you. And we will take you out. Because of how big he is. Not how big you are. How big he is. This afternoon, I'm going to go look at Bill's. but I'm not going to stare at them. I'm going to look at them and I'm going to do like Hezekiah did. I'm going to put them before God. I'm going to say, God, see that bill? See that bill? You see that bill? Wow, that one, they need four grand. You see that bill? I'm going to put them all back in the folder and said, now that you've seen them, I'm asking you to act. Let heaven respond because I'm believing you for it. I'm believing you for it. You've promised, you've declared it, and you are good on your word. And that's all I need. It's good enough for me. Yeah. And that folder will come out again as God meets needs. And I take each bill and I pay it, mail it in and mail it in and mail it in. But I'm not looking at that folder every day because I refuse to stare at giants. I'd rather look to the Lord, my provider. Amen. Let's stand together. You might be here today and maybe you're going through a real, real, real time in your life. I would challenge you Begin to look to the Lord. Begin to look to the Lord. Declare his promise. Affirm his promise. Faith affirms what God has said. Affirm it. Affirm it. Keep affirming it.
And don't let the word if become a part of your life. That when you hear the word if, tell the devil, get behind me. Get behind me. I don't need that. Get behind me. There is no if with God. God is yes and amen. Amen? Amen. amen. amen.